Hi, everyone. I'm Tanya Balaram. Um, I've been with Goldman Sachs for 14 years now, and I head up the operations risk and resilience team. This is a first-line team uh, in the bank, and we support the operations functions in managing their risk. Uh, our team is made up of resilience, um, quality assurance, um, as well as our governance as well. We take it very seriously at the bank, and therefore uh, we have quite a strong team um, you know, aligned to each of the businesses to support them in those endeavours. Thank you very much. Now, when we discussed uh, beforehand um, operation resilience, we wanted to make clear and look at the focus very much from the PRA, Bank of England, FCA, uh, SS1, SS2, and the going-ons, rather than looking at DORA and many others and the SEC. So there's a broad focus on operation resilience. But today, we're going to particularly focus on what Goldman and HSBC have been doing. So I wanted to just sort of quickly pitch where are we today uh, uh, and what uh, that means, what the PRA requirements. So... In January, the uh, CEO letter from the PRA came out, and these were the defined objectives going forward. Uh, the expansion, uh, very much of operational resilience to include things like diversity and inclusion is expected. We're going to see more evolution to include those ESG things, that's the S, but also the environmentals, and we see this expanding considerably. The reason this all came about uh, is, again, re-emphasized by the Articos Capital Statement, where a huge failing uh, of, due to all the things that risk management has been chasing against but somehow still failed. And so they're trying to, in this particular focus, try and readdress that. So there's quite detailed legislation, all these things going through. And I just wanted to give a context because operational resilience in the energy industry and in the water industry uh, are less perhaps bound but have the same focus. And that's very much this business continuity enhanced and evolved to actually look at the ongoing concerns of the business, reliance on the third parties and how they can impact you and how you go forward. So where we are today, Jenny, may I ask, how have you coped with those challenges and where are you today? Um, I think it's been, it's been quite challenging because it is, it is really pivoting us to much more of a service-focused view than a, a sort of risk-siloed view. Um, so that's been one of the key challenges, I think, for us. Where we are today, certainly in the UK, is we've identified and mapped our important business services. We've defined our impact tolerances. And what we're now starting to do is, is really move into looking at the scenario analysis and the testing that we need to do, um, which, again, is, is quite challenging because of the events that you've got to try and think up, you know, to make them sort of severe but plausible. Um, and I think as well, it's expecting the disruption and thinking about how you're going to recover from that disruption. And I'm thinking as well, I think, not just about your systems or your customer or your financial resilience, but think about as well your people resilience when you're working through those events. You know, they, they could be ongoing for quite some time. Um, and, you know, if you're troubleshooting and working through to resolve those events, the impact on your own people, um, you know, because you're going to the same SMEs probably time and again, um, to do that recovery is quite challenging, I think. So we're working through all of those aspects at the moment. And obviously, as you said, thinking about our third parties, but not only our third parties, but our fourth parties and our fifth parties. And where are the weakest links in, in that chain? Brilliant. Tanya, maybe if I can come to you first. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've been, we were already on a journey of a bit of an uplift. So, you know, these are concepts we had always held dear. But what we found was that in trying to respond to the PRA, you know, we couldn't get all of that data together in one place. So we focused on our tooling. We've upgraded, you know, the systems that we use to capture our important business services and uh, the, the associated tolerances, um, but also the definitions behind that and everything it comes with building a new um, resilience tool, um, bringing the firm together. So, you know, we had worked in very much in silos. You know, we pride, prided ourselves in operations and having a very robust um, OBR tool. We, we take uh, what we call cross-regional handover very seriously. So the ability to um, stay resilient by handing over functions to different regions should one region uh, be um, out of operation. So bringing all that together, trying to create 
tooling that enables us to um, look at things from a firm-wide perspective and respond to the PRA in a, in a cohesive way has been, has been a lot of our focus. Um, obviously, we went through the Dear CEO letter and looked at all of our processes as well, and we continue to be on that journey of the uplift. Uh, so it starts with the tooling, it follows with our people um, and our ability to enact resilience, you know, when we need it. And again, another um, service that we provide is the, the ability to respond to situations as they arise. And, you know, we have people dedicated to this so that, you know, there is someone to corral all the right folks together to troubleshoot, you know, what do we need to do? Who do we need to contact? Who do we need to keep informed should a situation arise? So we looked at various scenarios, particularly as we were, you know, we continue in the Russia-Ukraine crisis. You know, we looked at certain scenarios like if SWIFT was, was to be out, what would we do? If our CREST system was down, what would we do? You know, all the key reliance that we have on our, our systems, but also um, our third parties as well. You, looking at those different scenarios and hypo hypothetically thinking about how we would play those through. Um, so we've focused a lot on that um, and then building some of that um, sort of information that we've learned into our systems, you know, creating the playbooks, creating the, the sort of the process should, should certain situations arise. And so that's been a real key focus for us. Thanks for that. Michael, uh, your view on the challenges for the customers and people you've been working with, uh, how have they faced this challenge? Well, uh, in one respect, uh, there's a focus on accountability too, because not only does operational resilience from the, the FCA, PRA, Bank of England expand and grow, but you also have the UK SMCR, the Senior Manager, Manager's Regime Certification Regime, it's expanded too. You mentioned... Uh, the, the environmental piece of that. I mean, now the banks have to have the, a, a senior management function that has environmental oversight too. So you're seeing the expansion at two levels that have an interrelationship. But the other thing is, is the global view of operational resilience. Oh, for one thing, operational resilience crosses all industries. You don't need to have a regulation for operational resilience to be a necessity in your organization. I think the last three years of the pandemic and then the war in the Ukraine and the geopolitical risks, I think every industry here understands that we need operational resilience, whether we have a regulation or not. But not only do you have the UK's regulation, you've got the EU DORA, Digital Operational Resilience Act. You've got Basel and the Bank for International Settlements Guidance on Operational Resilience. You've got the United States, OCC, Office of the, Office of the Control of the Currency, Guidance on Operational Resilience. And it's coming at us from a lot of different angles. Now, you look at these, the EU and the uh, Basel Bank for International Settlements and the US OCC, they all put resilience in the context of risk management, which I think is good. I don't understand why business continuity like, was buried in the bowels of the organization and never talked to risk management. It made no sense. Uh, but the, the thing I find with those definitions versus the UK is they're all really truly focused on resilience and, and being the recovery from an event. So you look at the definition of, e of operational resilience from the US OCC, the Basel, Bank for International Settlements, and DORA, it's about the recovery from risk event. I find the UK's definition rather interesting because it's the only one that brings the idea of agility, that, that whole concept of being able to avoid events, not just recover from events. You know, if I'm running down the street and I trip over a pothole, uh, and, and resilience is how quickly can I get back up and start running again? But agility is this whole idea of being able to see that pothole and navigate around it or leverage it or minimize the impact of it. And so I'm seeing a huge focus as we move into 2023. Not only do we need to be resilient, we also need risk agility to be able to see what's coming at the organization and prepare it, not just to recover from the event, but to avoid it, mitigate it, even use it to the corporation's advantage, potentially. And I think it's a good point that the advantage taking this and growing, we, we had that on the, my last session when we were dealing with the third line, the internal audit, and actually how you can profit and benefit by improved systems and collaboration across the silos. One of the things you mentioned, uh, Tanya, was, was this hassle, if you like, we say, of pulling together the data from the different silos. Uh, and that was a, a challenge. Um, even though you have supposedly centralized systems, there's so many systems you need to pull data from to centralize. And that's still quite a manual process, you said. Do you see that changing in the near future? I'll go back to Tanya. Oh, well, we're trying to solve that by trying to be on the same tooling. But, you know, you still need 
smart brains to look at the information that you're getting and try and make some conclusion from it, try and ensure that you make the right decisions from it. So, you know, we don't see that changing completely, but definitely get it collecting the right information, trying to be consistent so that you can, you know, look at it in, in a consistent fashion together and then making the right decisions with that information. And as Michael suggested, one of the things that we're very keen on is looking at particularly how we measure you know, risk, how we measure um, our key metrics, because that's an indication to us of where to look, of the concerns that we might have. Um, so measuring our reliance on third parties, for example, is, is an area that we will look at, because as, as we rely more on third parties, you know, we want to make sure that that's still being reflected within our risk management suite. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's changing, but it's not completely uh, solved yet. Jenny? Very similar experience to Tanya. Obviously, in HSBC, we have you know a lot of, of different systems, so the data is not all in one place. So it is about bringing it all together and giving you know the the accountable executives that holistic view across that service. You know, and, and they want to see it from the customer aspect, from the systems aspect, from the people aspect. Um, so you know, you've got that data, but it's all in silos, and, and how you then bring all that together. And Place, yeah, uh, and obviously your third-party data as well. So, quite a challenge. Yeah. In March, the PRA rapidly put in the CRR, the capital regulation requirement, added in, if you like, and sort of said, "Oh, we've got to add this in." Um, and they looked at the aggregation and group aggregation. Uh, is, is that something that you have you been able to aggregate across the the subsidiaries? I mean, I know you're in UK, but. You, you do that up to group in a we, satisfactory we do, manner? Yeah, as, it's, as part of our natural capital planning and capital reporting, so we do do that. And obviously, you know, we, we do scenarios that look at both the sort of group impacts and then the local UK impacts as well. Great. Now, I mean, I wanted to move on to the other thing you were talking about, which is scenario testing, which, again, the PRA said is this is the next step that they're looking for and making sure that people are compliant. Um, when you're measuring these metrics and the thresholds, are you looking to more quantification? Because, you know, in the past, we've been very subjective in operational risk, and this has been a big debate. Are we ready for quantification? Is there a real value? It was summarised quite earlier there, um, uh, trying to find the man from Meta. I've really forgotten the Gareth. Uh, sorry, I apologise profusely. But uh, you were saying how it's not about creating a total quantification of value, but actually having a perspective um, but how are you coping with quantification? Are you using any at the moment, and where's your view? So we, we are through the scenarios that we're doing, and, and, you know, particularly when we're looking at those capital aspects, so we are looking at that quantification quite heavily. But I think for me, and to Michael's point as well, um, obviously the quantification is important because you need to understand, I guess, that break point for the bank, um, really, and where, you know, you may have liquidity assets issues mm, yeah. as a result of, of whatever the incident is. But I think for me as well, equally as important out of the scenario analysis is, is really the actions that we're going to take and we need to take and identify in those actions, um, you know, and, and where maybe we need to improve our controls or put more controls in place to, to mitigate those extreme events. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's driving us really, I guess, to a new way of thinking about these extreme events, you know, I, I think it's the, becoming much more plausible, I guess, in a way for people than maybe they have previously. And, and you know, you're much more about thinking the unthinkable now. Um, so it's, I, I think for me, that's the really important thing. And that means that we can put those proactive and preventative measures in place to kind of try and sidestep that pothole. Whereas before, you know, we weren't in that position to be able to do that. Is that the same for you, Sam? Yeah, we've, uh, you know, our focus previously was around specific process and how we quantify each process and how well it's doing. And now we're, we're sort of flipping more towards, you know, our controls, how robust are our controls and how can we use, you know, quantification to ensure that we can measure how robust those controls are. So we're trying very hard to bring the two together. Because as we um, see pressures in our system, it is 
in the numbers. It means manifested in the numbers. And therefore, being able to identify the controls that are un under pressure and understand how we either mitigate that or you know, wind that effect back. And so that's where a lot of our scenarios look at. We look at the sort of controls that have really suffered in this time, like ever since post-COVID have continued to, to be under stress and, and really trying to come up with the sort of mitigating actions that we can take to ensure that, that we bring those controls back under, you know, to a point where we, we feel comfortable. Um, and so there's lots of focus on that. There's lots of focus on thinking about the different scenarios. You know, we just had the biggest uh, resilience event in terms of managing through, through COVID. You know, what can we learn? But as Jenny says, you know, we have to prepare for what would have been unthinkable previously. So we're having to think outside the box in terms of, you know, what could happen and how would we, um, you know, how would we respond um, and what changes do we need to make now to make sure that that response is effective. Michael. You said several key words to me, uh, the unthinkable, thinking outside the box, um, and scenarios and all this. To, this gets to a lot of what I've been writing about in my research, that if we really want to be agile and resilient to the risk, we need to change the way we approach risk. And that a lot of traditional risk management has been with the left side of the brain, that quantitative uh, risk analysis. We build out our risk models. Uh, you know, Sir, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of the Sherlock Holmes series, said it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has facts. One begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. He's all about quantified data, left brain thinking. Uh, obviously, he's not a bank regulator. He's a, a fictional detective. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure with Sherlock Holmes. But, uh, but in that context, left brain thinking is where we've been. And I'm not saying we get rid of that. We need that. And we just talked about quantitative analysis. But the, the, the other thing is the whole right brain thinking, that creative, imaginative thinking, to be able to think outside the box. If left brain thinking is thinking inside the box, my risk models, you know, the creative right brain thinking is thinking that outside the box. Where can things go wrong? What, 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 my model was built five years ago. What's it not telling me today? I mean, models never accurately represent the real world. There's too many variables in the real world. So models approximate the real world, and models break. And t things change, and the variables and inputs change. And we need creative right brain thinking on risk just as much as we need left brain thinking. Very valid. Um, I wanted to just sort of come back to DSP3, which you already said you're looking at that third party, fourth party. So there's a consultation paper out because they know it's so key. Um, can you explain, you know, how deep you dive? You know, we, we gave some classic examples in the last presentation that uh, Tanya and I did. Uh, but I'd love to hear from, from you, Jenny, as to some experiences and where, you, where the unexpected, as Michael said, that you might have come across, where that, that fourth party that you didn't expect to come was a risk. Yeah, it, and, and if I'm honest, you know, we, we've just had some recently, there have been some streetwide events that have impacted on us, I think, as, as an industry. Um, and they were, you know, fourth parties for us, not third parties. Um, so that is really the challenge for us. And I, I think, you know, we're still on that journey to really identify and get under the cover of particularly the fourth and fifth parties and understanding you know, who your third parties have outsourced to, what their controls are over um, their third parties um, to ensure that their controls are robust as well. Um, and then capturing all that data and then being able to present that to give that view. Um, so, yeah, still on that journey, I would say, at the moment, Charles, and I think that's, you know, that's a big piece of, of work and area of focus for us. Michael, it leverages that other side of the brain. Uh, <laughs> anything to comment on, on how you find those fourth and fifth parties and then what, what you need to do that? It's absolutely complex uh, because you look at uh, the extended enterprise and you can't even define where a bank or insurance company or whatever industry you're in where starts and stops anymore. It's not the modern organization is not defined by brick and mortar walls and traditional employees. The modern organization is an extended web of Outsourcers, service providers, contractors, consultants, suppliers, vendors, brokers, agents, dealers, intermediaries, and more. And, and they all bring in risk to our environment. You walk down the halls of any you know, organization here in the UK or in Europe, half the people you walk by are probably third parties. They're, they're outsourcers, service providers, contractors, consultants, and more. And we need to really be able to manage that. And they have a huge impact on 
operational resilience in the organization. Thank you. Tani, your view on third and fourth? And Absolutely. It's, it's super critical. And we find that we're moving to an age where we're relying more and more every year on third and fourth parties. And one of the things that we um, are really sort of focused on is ensuring that those third and fourth parties are sort of bound by our own risk management standards. You know, we pride ourselves on having very high standards and we want to make sure that they're applied um, accordingly by, by those third parties. So making sure that they, you know, come to the plate on that and uh, making decisions that if, if you don't, then, then you can't work with us. And that's that's very difficult when, as a risk manager, I'm telling that to my business manager, but, but it's super important. So what we try to do is ensure that the, the, um, the standards that we hold internally can be applied you know, to our third and fourth parties, and we ask them to you know, log error events in the same way that we would internally. As an example, um, you know, the vetting process is as rigorous um, and so, you know, it's about applying the same standards all the way through. And so it's something that the business continues to struggle with, um, but it's part of our role and we see it becoming more and more of a focus compared to previously. Uh, and much of this obviously relies on sending out surveys to your third parties to them to be open and honest and transparent about their own third parties. Do you, do you see that as a challenge, though, uh, and do you think that will put the cost of supply up? It's definitely a challenge for us. I mean, we monitor how many outstanding questionnaires we have, and it's a, it's a risk that just continues to increase. Um, and so this is why we have to get to a point where we need to make decisions if, if we're not getting the responses. And don't get me wrong, the questionnaires are quite extensive. Um, you know, then we need to be making some quite harsh uh, risk decisions, but it be it's become you know, quite a key focus for us because, you know, not every third party wants to re respond to all the questions. Thank you. I'm conscious of time. We sort of hit the 30 minutes, and I know there's a lot of people in the, the audience that are buzzing questions on operational resilience, so perhaps we can open it to the floor for some questions. Over in the back there. <coughs> Uh, thanks, folks. Um, just another final point there around um, third and fourth parties and the requirements on them. Um, do, do we get worried about that becoming anti-competitive and do we then start worrying about concentration risk around, amongst suppliers and at what point does it become a real problem? Any views? We do it as well. I'm... <laughs> yeah, concentration risk is a, is a real concern for us. Um, and how to monitor it or measure it is also something that we're very... Um, Flexed with, but uh, it's definitely um, something which we know is part of the business makeup at the moment, and we expect that as we rely more on our on our third parties, that concentration is, is something that we also need to monitor and, and do well at. But but we weren't really monitoring it as closely um, before, so it's definitely a key focus now. Yeah, very similar experience for HSBC. Um, I think for some services, concentration risk is unavoidable. You know, if you think about cloud providers, for example, um, and then it's, you know, really about understanding in depth their resilience, their plans for recovery, um, you know, and thinking about things like stressed exits as well and making sure that you've got those plans in place for your third parties as well. Yep. Just we'll get to mic. Ask coming. Thank you. Thank you. So now UK policy define the important business service resource mapping and scenario testing. So next step will be, I think, is assurance of the auditing. So what you, uh, how are you preparing for the internal audit? and uh, assurance require, requirements. Maybe it's coming from, you know, if uh, the regulator is preparing the requirement, but uh, uh, would you please share how you prepare for the assurance and audit and activities? So, so we actually have a, an assurance team that sits within the first line. Now, it's not typically a first line um, discipline, but what we want to do is take the opportunity to work with the managers to um, 
help them understand you know, where they could be falling short, where the gaps might be. And so we will use that assurance program to kind of understand where, you know, versus the requirements where we might have gaps to try and address them before the regulator comes in. So we, we often deploy this, um, we call it like service, our QA team, to go and have a look. So to go and test what's been done, you know, ahead of um, internal audit coming in or the regulator coming in. So we will deploy that. And similarly in HSBC, we have a, a dedicated assurance utility that tests the controls. But obviously within my team, I'm second line of defense. So we've been sat around the table while the first line have been defining those important business services and their impact tolerances and starting to do that scenario analysis and testing. And we've been reviewing and challenging what they've done as the second line through that process already. Uh, and, and I see that continuing as, a, as an ongoing and enduring activity. Better to conclude. So thank you. I'd like to thank the panel. Thank you so much for your insights and sharing. Thank you. Thank you.